Welcome everyone to a session named Progressively Decoupled Panels from Weather.com to Woo and Beyond. Woo! <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Please do do that. You do. <laughs> this is going to go really well. Isn't it? <laughs> My name is Matt Davis. I am a lead architect for Media Current, an awesome place to work that is very actively hiring talent. So. <laughs> If you're interested, <laughs> you should uh, hit me up afterwards. Why, did you just resign or something? <laughs> <laughs> Today, I'll be talking about the weather.com project, the weather underground project, uh, decoupled Drupal, and where things are headed with Drupal 8. If you weren't already aware, weather.com is a Drupal site. It launched in November 2014. It was then and may still be at this point the highest traffic Drupal site in the world um, and posed some really interesting challenges for us to solve. These are some of the metrics that Weather brought to us uh, when they were evaluating Drupal as a possible platform to use for their new site. Um, as you can see, crazy traffic patterns uh, 50 million paid views per day with their existing cache strategy, which I use that term very loosely. About half of those requests were going all the way to origin boxes. They had 144 origin servers that were getting frequently overloaded. Um, and part of what makes their traffic patterns unique is it has extremely high variability because an average day will have relatively low consistent traffic and then when a major weather event occurs, traffic spikes big time. Um, also, part of what makes their site unique is that uh, it's got to be hyper-localized. So we have here, uh, at the time, they were doing forecast data for 2.9 million locations. Now they're actually doing sub-zip code stuff, and they're over a billion different locations that they're serving uh, localized data for. Uh, as an example uh, of the traffic patterns, this was the highest uh, re single busiest week in weather history before the Drupal project began. Over a billion page requests in seven days. Uh, and they knew they had a big problem because they couldn't keep the site up. But mostly I'm not going to be talking about caching strategy today. We're going to be talking about what we built for them to serve their internal team needs in terms of pushing their development forward and how Drupal met those demands. So the major team considerations that we had to deal with for the weather project were these two teams that a lot of enterprise uh, level sites uh, need to cater to. Their front end developer team, which is quite large, they have a lot of JavaScript developers that want to be able to work on JavaScript, not on Drupal. JavaScript developers don't want to care about Drupal at all. And the more we can get Drupal out of their way, the better. Also, they want to be able to keep up with what is a very rapidly changing ecosystem, uh, probably the most rapidly changing ecosystem in the tech world right now. Uh, also, they have a large editorial team that wants to be able to work independently of any developers. They want to be able to not only intuitively create new content, but roll out entire new pages and types of layouts for these pages without needing to go bug a developer every time they want to do this. But the single biggest consideration we have to keep in mind uh, when trying to solve the problems of those two teams is how is it going to perform and scale. So how did we approach these problems? First, we took a step back and took a long, hard look at what is actually on a weather page. So this is the, one of the forecast pages for Holman, Wisconsin, for some reason. Um, and if we look at this page and kind of break it down, we start to notice a few things. So we have very different, distinct sections on this page in terms of, down here we have articles. Those articles are identical regardless of if you're in Holman, Wisconsin, or Orlando, Florida. So they have a very different uh, set of needs in terms of cacheability, time to live, 
than, say, the actual forecast data that has to be hyper-localized and have very, very low time to live. So as we look at these things, we start to break apart the components into the page and identify different ways to serve the different sections on the site. Uh, so this is another view of that, really just to show that as you switch between two different locations, you see the URL changes, and we have these specific bits of localized data, but a lot of the page can actually be cached for a lot longer than that and served to everyone. So, Panels comes to our rescue in this case. It allows us to group related things. It allows us to <coughs> manage related uh, presentations. Um, the interface, uh, if you've used panels much, is not the most intuitive, but we found with proper training, editorial teams were able to use uh, panels effectively on their own. And using panels content types, uh, you can reuse the same pieces of of functionality over and over on different pages as well. So if you're not familiar, this is what the uh, panel's user interface looks like. Uh, and you can probably already start to see here these individual uh, boxes are kind of representative of the sections on the site that I showed before. Um, some of you may notice as well this is not quite uh, core panels because if you look at content rows two and three in core panels, those would just be uh, distinct rows, but we've actually developed a module called Classy Panel Styles, the maintainer of which is sitting in the back there. Um, and what that does is give you a higher fidelity on the back end of what uh, your panel is gonna actually look like on the front end. So you can apply classes to both so that it does things like split this into two uh, columns <coughs> as it'll look like on the actual page. So, panels solved some of our problems. It allowed us to give the editorial team at Weather a lot more control over putting pieces of content and functionality onto their pages as they wanted to do. But where do those content, where does that content come from? And how is it actually served at render time? And how does that all play into our performance and scalability needs? And this is where the whole idea of headless or decoupling begins to enter the scene. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard the terms headless Drupal tossed around a lot. It's had a lot of hype the last couple of years uh, and with good reason. Um, the promise of headless uh, is very platform flexibility, meaning uh, it can be used, for example, as an upgrade tool. When you decouple the front end and the back end of your site, you can update either one without having to touch the other. So it gives you more flexibility in choosing to say, choose uh, to switch from one front end presentation layer to another, or to upgrade from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 without having to change your presentation layer. Uh, it also allows for a richer user experience because once you're decoupled, the front end can run as fast as they want with innovating uh, on their user experience and use the bleeding edge technology, whatever new JavaScript thing is the, is the hot thing of the day. Uh, and also, and this is important in the weather case, we have the idea of create once and publish everywhere. So in a headless model, generally the, the typical uh, way it plays out is content is created in a Drupal site, and then that is served out, uh, for example, through JSON or XML endpoints, which are then consumed uh, by a front-end rendering framework or uh, by a cell phone app or by any other feed that wants to ingest those endpoints. So you can create the same node, serve it out as JSON, and then different systems can ingest it and render it uh, how they want to. But when you fully decouple, you create some problems for yourself. The one of most concern uh, for our case is you cut out that editorial team out of the process. So in a fully decoupled solution, if the editorial team says, hey, we want to try a new layout on this site, they have to go bug from in developers to say, will you build us a new version of this in this new layout? 
and that's a problem. Uh, there are also front-end performance concerns as far as fully decoupling and having tons of requests being made. Um, and you lose some of what, uh, depending on how you do it, you lose some of what Drupal is really good at. Things like redirecting, uh, path aliasing, meta tags, uh, unless you have an isomorphic solution to that, which I'll get a little bit more into later. Uh, and uh, what can be considered a problem is that uh, it gives the front-enders a ton of control over how things are going to play out. So unless you have a lot of faith in your front-end team's ability to architect things in a really consistent way, an extendable way, uh, you've basically taken off all the guardrails for your site and you pull a couple. So our presentation framework, also called Angular Mods, now called Progressively Decoupled Panels, because we're really bad at naming things, <laughs> uh, is an attempt to solve all of these problems at once. And this is a big part of the basic idea, is we want to empower these front-end JavaScript developers to access as much of Drupal's power as possible without having to really know anything about how Drupal works. So how does that all play out? At its core, this is a way for us to put these content types, uh, CTools content types, onto a page that are written by JavaScript developers. Uh, and at, in its first iteration, it supported Angular 1, uh, static content, just HTML templates, and tipple fibs as well. And those could be served either by Drupal uh, at origin or by edge site includes, which I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about edge site includes, but we can cover uh, how that plays into all this uh, at the end in QA. You got a question? Putting modules on a page, is that like a Drupal module? No, I'm sorry. So this is, again, we're really bad at naming things. Uh, so, we, so we called these individual widgets uh, Angular mods. So that what they are on the Drupal side is CTools content types because also Merlin of Chaos was really bad at naming <laughs> things and called CTools content types even though we already have content types um, in Drupal core. So I hope that was as confusing as it sounded. <laughs> um, and this gives us some other cool things when we ingest these as panels CTools content types allows us to reuse them. It makes them exportable so we can store these things fully in code. They are sectioned off and independent and they are versionable so we can declare dependencies on specific versions when we need to. Um, so I know that's a kind of confusing way to go through all that but this is what it actually plays out and looks like. So this is an individual uh, Angular module that a front-end developer has written. So what you have in here is the CSS, SAS, the templates, uh, all of the testing. But down here, this info file right here is the really important part. And all that info file is is a JSON uh, file that declares out to Drupal and says, hey, I'm a piece of Angular functionality. You should let editors use me and put me on page. And then it all gets ingested by Drupal, and this forecast module, declared, written, without any Drupal APIs in it, get dropped on, can be dropped onto the page as a panel pane, and rendered by Angular. And how does that all play out? Uh, in a very complex way. So, I'm not gonna go over all of this, but the basic part I do wanna talk about here, uh, you see here, this is the part, this is the Drupal wrapper, right? So these are the, this is the pieces that have the longest time to live and the most cacheability. This is what's generated at origin, right? And the content is pushed out to our services layer, so the actual nodes and things like that are pushed out uh, to our services layer, which is a Mongo database with a key value store using UUID module. Uh, so we have a series of endpoints. So when the Angular components need actual Drupal node data and views and things like that, we have custom endpoints built on Mongo database. I'll go into why that's actually pretty problematic 
in a little while. Um, but the all of the personalized parts are rendered client side at the very end. Um, and this allows us to cache as much as possible and just pull in the pieces that we need client side at the end. So when we built all of this, we had some buy-in from their front end team, but we really didn't know once we released all this if they were gonna run with it or not. Well, to date we have over 200 Angular modules written completely by their front end team without having to bother us, or without having to learn any Drupal. So it has been a huge success. Uh, their, Angular, uh, their Angular developers love it. The editorial teams love it. Um, there are some problems that we can get into with it, uh, but it has been a resounding success and a vast improvement over what they had before. Uh, and in terms of the cacheability, we went from the 144 origin boxes that we used to have down to 12, and most of those sit idle. So, that was all the backstory, and that site launched back in November 2014. So, that's kind of history at this point. Uh, but there's been a lot of movement and a lot of change since then. So, if you don't know, the weather company that owns weather.com also owns another site, Weather Underground underground.com and they have in the last few months begun to migrate onto this same platform a Drupal based platform that we built for originally for the weather.com project but weather underground they're kind of they kind of like to be the innovation area uh, they, they like to experiment a lot um, and they didn't want to be bound to angular 1.3 which is what weather.com is currently running um, so I've been leading the Weather Underground migration onto this platform, and when I got out to San Francisco last November, one of their first big asks was, can we explore using Angular 2 instead of Angular 1? Well, at that time, Angular 2 was still alpha. It went beta finally in December, um, but it is not slated for release until sometime this summer. Um, so, I began evaluating the what it would take to refactor this entire system to work not just with Angular 1.3, but also with Angular 2. This is especially problematic because both sites are built on the exact same code base. And so anything we change in the Angular modules can't break weather.com. It has to work. It has to be completely backwards compatible with what already exists in the wild. And given the caching layers, uh, even each deployment can't is not allowed to clear caches, so it creates a lot of crazy things that you have to jump through to get these kind of big refactoring changes out. So Angular 2 in this system, in some ways, it's a much better fit. So the kind of uh, compartmentalization we did with those directories where each Angular module lives in its own directory, uh, that was kind of an a, a imposed structure that we made uh, on the original version. That's not something that Angular 1 inherently does, but Angular 2, uh, built on kind of the React model, is completely component-based. So it's got these natural separations between pieces of functionality. Uh, also, uh, lazy loading was something we added uh, after we built the original Angular 1 implementation of this. And our lazy loading, like as you scroll down a page, more things get pulled in and loaded and rendered. Uh, our implementation of that in Angular 1 was very hacky and didn't really uh, serve the needs we wanted. For example, we still had to load, we had to front load a lot of JavaScript and CSS assets uh, just because of the way the whole thing was written. But in Angular 2, we don't have to do that. We can actually, as you scroll, pull in the entire component with all the assets uh, as we scroll. So in some ways that makes uh, the Angular 2 implementation a better fit for this system. But in other ways it was really not a better fit. So <laughs> um, Angular 2, as I said, is completely component based, but how do those components talk to each other? Well in the normal Angular 2 pattern, uh, components pass data up to a parent component and then events are passed back down into a sibling component 
of the original one. So you have to have this idea of like a wrapper component around everything, which doesn't sound like an inherent problem, but the thing is, is that our wrapper component has to be the entire rendered output of a panel, some pieces of which we still want rendered server-side by Drupal. So if we put, and components have to have templates. So if we put those things into the template, then Angular is going to want to render that entire template over the top of what we've already rendered server-side. Um, also, Angular 2, as of this moment, uh, doesn't have the ability to really reuse the same component multiple times on a page because each component that you use has an individual selector in it and there's no way to do, well there is a way, uh, but we had to work directly with the Angular team at Google to get a workaround while they actually make dynamic uh, selectors possible. So um, these were both problems that we worked directly with the Angular team to solve. So, where is all this going ultimately? Uh, as I mentioned, as of right now. Wow. <laughs> as everybody finally gets it, he ruins it. <laughs> as I mentioned, right now in our system, you can build either Angular 1 or Angular 2 modules uh, or components, which is really a better term for them. Um, but this, this refactoring that's gone on to accommodate that opens the door for why can't we build them in Ember? Why can't we build them in React? We have made it theoretically possible to uh, try out a bunch of different JavaScript frameworks. And the front end teams at both Weather Underground and Weather.com are really excited about that possibility. Because like I said, the JavaScript ecosystem is changing really rapidly and they want to be able to play with things. So in our current implementation, you can on a per page variant basis choose what you want your presentation layer to be. So you can say on this page, I wanna use Angular 1. On this page, I wanna use Angular 2. On this page, I wanna use React. Or I wanna spin up a new version in this other framework and A-B test it and see which one has higher conversion rates or higher click through or whatever um, and then go with that one. So, Drupal 8. This whole system is built in Drupal 7, but the Drupal 8 version is coming, slowly but surely. Sadly, I'm not getting paid to create it, so uh, as of right now, it's something I've been playing with in the, all the spare time that I have. Meaning, the live demo I'm gonna show you in a few minutes, I wrote in a single weekend. Um, it's very, very early stages, but there's a lot of exciting stuff. First and foremost, Forget about decoupled panels. In Drupal 8, blocks aren't terrible anymore. <laughs> we can actually use blocks, and actually in Drupal 8, panels is built on top of blocks. So when you use panels in Drupal 8, you're still using the same exact blocks uh, as Core does. So in the Drupal 8 version of this, you can use all of this functionality inside of panels or just in Core blocks. Um, and we get a lot of other cool stuff that comes with it. Plugin API is really cool. The libraries API lets, gives us great improvement on declaring out these frameworks. I'll show you some of that in a minute. Um, views and rests are in core now, so that whole crazy Mongo database uh, services layer that I was talking about, while it still has a lot of validity in terms of scaling, uh, the reason that's been a big problem for the weather project is because every time a new endpoint is needed, for a new page or a new piece of functionality that wants to ingest data in a new way, they have to go to, the, to, to a separate team, this database layer team, and say, hey, can you create a new endpoint for us because we want to use the data a little differently, and it takes a bunch of cycles to make that happen. Uh, so uh, one thing that I'm really excited about is the possibility of using GraphQL. Uh, there is active development on a Drupal 8 GraphQL module right now, and if you're not familiar with what that is, it's basically a way for the client side to send the type of, the exact structure of data in a request that it wants back instead of an endpoint already existing. And it is returned exactly in the structure filled in with that exact data. All right, so let's have a look at the Drupal 8 version of this. 
Um, so in the Drupal 8 version right now, there's no, there's no delineation. You can put uh, multiple frameworks on the same page. Uh, so what you see here is I have three blocks on this page. One is a regular Drupal rendered block. One's an Angular 2 block, and one's a React block. I'll show you what those look like in code in a second. But here they are. This is panels in Drupal 8, uh, but you could just as easily use core blocks to drop these same pieces on the page. And here's what they look like. Uh, so here we have an actual Angular 2 rendered block, a React Hello World block, and a custom Drupal block. And you'll see that come in and see two-way binding on the page. So let's look at what those individual components look like. Uh, yes. All right, so this is my progressively decoupled blocks module. Inside of it, you'll see I have two sub-modules for Angular 2 and React, which is all I've written at this point. But let's look at what the actual individual pieces look like. So inside of the Angular 2, we have these individual components. Uh, instead of the JSON info file that I showed you before, now we have YAML files. And that's all it takes to declare this piece of functionality out to Drupal, just like the JSON version. And then all you have is your TypeScript file and your template. No Drupal involved. You can write your components on the fly. Um, and there's some cool stuff going on. Uh, I didn't really get into how that's all ingested uh, by Drupal in the Drupal 7 version, but basically it's all a CTools plugin. If you're familiar with content type callbacks in CTools, um, all of those components that we have a function that walks the, all those directories looking for those JSON info files, gathers the, all that metadata up, caches the crap out of it, uh, and then returns it as a CTools content type callback. Uh, most people write those as returning single content types, but you can actually just return an array and get a whole bunch of them as your result. Uh, in the Drupal 8 version of this, we're using block derivatives instead, uh, which allows you to take a single block definition and then expand it out and create multiple types of blocks from it. Uh, and we're also using to walk the YAML files instead of this custom JSON thing that we were using. Uh, we're piggybacking on the exact same YAML uh, ingestion as Drupal core uses. So I got to write the extension, extending extension. Um, so that was fun. Question. Yes. Can uh, those JS files exist? Absolutely. Uh, in the Drupal 7 version, we actually have a hook where you can define which specific directories to look for those in. Uh, so you can have like a, a symbolic link. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I can show more code if y'all want. I just wanted to give a quick demo of that. Uh, don't ever put Angular 2 and React on the same page like I did. <laughs> So that's what we've done with that project. Um, but where is Drupal in general headed with all of this? Uh, if any of you guys have been following, there's been a lot of talk in the last couple of months. Uh, Dries has been blogging about progressive decoupling a lot, um, and specifically about maybe pulling a JavaScript framework in the core. Uh, I think we're fighting a lot of the fully, there's a lot of push for fully uh, decoupled solutions. Uh, and there's a lot of fear about that. Uh, and there, there rightly should be from the Drupal community, I think. Uh, so one of the fears I've heard is from people who own Drupal shops that are finding that uh, clients are asking for fully decoupled solutions and they don't, uh, they're getting less and less of builds because all they're doing now is building. They're getting the 30% of the build that's building the back end and some other JavaScript or front end team is handling the entire front end presentation of that same project. Uh, this should also, there's also fear in, in hosting companies uh, because a lot of the Drupal hosting companies don't support node boxes, uh, which means that they're only getting part of the hosting deals as well because people want other, uh, they want to be able to do spin up server side rendered JavaScript. Um, and the biggest part is, uh, and why we should be afraid about the consideration of putting a JavaScript framework into Drupal 8 core 
is because, like I've mentioned several times, things are moving really fast in that world. Uh, if you, some of you may know, right now, Backbone is in uh, Drupal 8 core. It was put in over two years before Drupal 8 was even released, uh, and it's basically antiquated now. Not entirely, but it's not where any of the action is these days, uh, which is why they're talking about putting another framework in core. Uh, but if they do that, the level of effort required to rip Backbone out and put whatever this new framework is into core, by the time that's accomplished, there could be some new hot new thing already uh, on the horizon. So I think our responsibility, if we want Drupal to survive, is to figure out how we can cater to this fast moving con to this fast moving ecosystem in the JavaScript world, how we can deliver cutting edge user experiences and satisfy the needs of editorial teams. And that's my presentation. <laughs>